United Methodist something or another on relief, um, is that they have no overhead. In other words, you give a dollar to UMCOR, it goes directly to aid. So that's really actually an amazing thing about the Methodist organization is that when we say we're going to make a difference in somebody's life, it literally, a dollar here is a dollar going out the other end. It's all sponsored by the church, so there is no overhead to it, which is pretty amazing. And uh, it's relevant, especially because in November, I'm also going to lead or at least organize a mission trip to that uh, very hard-hit area in, around, in and around Houston and in Texas in general and wherever God leads us. So uh, as we look for ways to find ways to connect, you know, that's going to be another opportunity to put our faith into action. Because it isn't not enough that we just talk about it here. It is not enough that we think about it. We actually have to do. And mission is a vital part of who we are as a church. And I talk about it and preach about it. And, and uh, now we need to live it out. And that's going to be an opportunity for us to, to uh, sign up and come along and see what we can do to make a difference in our community. And this area is obviously in trouble and hard hit. But I, I want to take you back to another kind of messy time in the life of Texans because way back in the 80s they had a huge problem with litter in Texas. In fact they came up with this slogan to help combat this horrible litter problem that is don't mess with Texas. You ever heard of that? Don't mess with Texas, right? Well that was a slogan developed by a marketing company to try to get people to start taking ownership into the problem that they were having with people just dumping trash out their windows of their cars. And believe it or not it worked and it helped clean up the mess. Well, now here we are, a week it seems like after the worst is over, and, and yet uh, this area, Houston and Bridgeport and Rockport and all these different little towns that were in the path of, of Hurricane Harvey uh, are, are a mess. They're a horrible mess. For some people, it's, it's something they're going to be able to manage. I mean, maybe it's they're going to have to clean out their floors that have been caked with mud and take down some sheetrock halfway up because of the floodwaters came up, but it's something they can at least deal with. For others, yeah, they're going to have to rebuild, start over. And it's a bigger mess, but, you know, with, with aid or insurance, uh, uh, there's hope. There's certainly hope for that community that over time, things are going to get back to normal. But there are some messes that, have, that are in Texas right now that aren't going to be so easy to take care of and may never be resolved. For example, there's a very, very messy situation for a family that, that um, had a disaster happen to them in an unexpected way. There was a little girl, I'm sure you've heard on the news, named Jordan that was uh, caught up in the, the hurricane when she was spotted by a rescue team floating down uh, this rather uh, uh, fast-paced moving water. The rescue team spotted her just before she was about to go underneath a trestle, a railroad trestle, where rescue at that point would have been absolutely impossible. She had been clinging to her mother's back, and just at the last second, the rescue team gets out there and saves her. Now, she'd been in the water for quite a while. Her name is Jordan. She'd been in the water for a while, and she was struggling with some hypothermia, thermia, but they'd ask, uh, you know, what had happened. And she was a little girl, but she managed to say, well, my mama was praying for us. My mama was praying. It was a miracle. I mean, an absolute miracle this little girl was saved, and it's a tragedy. Her mother was not. Really was. I was trying to imagine what kind of prayers was on, the, was on the heart of mom at this really horrible time in her life. Horrible. What was she thinking? What was she praying for? Well, we know this much about uh, her, Colette is her name, Colette Solcer. We know she was a nurse, and she came from a family of people that had servant attitudes. I mean, they were literally nurses in her family and pastors and military veterans. She came from a Christian family, deep Christian family. She herself had proclaimed her, her faith on Facebook and, and screamed out to the world, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. So when I think back, what was on her lips? I, the only thing I can imagine was on the lips of any mother who was faced with this life and death situation would be, God, please save my, my baby. What else could it have been? The miracle was answered. The prayer was answered. A miracle happened. And her faith in God had been fulfilled. Amen? Now I'm going to ask you to compartmentalize this, this 
really spiritual moment thought. I want you to put it over here for a second. And then I want us to, to travel across town in Houston to a completely different situation. Let's put that over there for a minute. And let's look at a different situation that was happening at Lakewood Church. If you don't know, Lakewood is the largest church in America. Uh, 30-some thousand people will attend their services each, each and every week. And uh, they're led by a pastor by the name of Joel Olstein, who's, uh, everybody knows him. He's fabulously wealthy and an uh, extremely successful church. But they ran into a, a messy situation of their own. Because somebody made the decision during the, this time of crisis not to open their doors to their community. And, uh, you know, news organizations are always looking to spot opportunities to talk about something. And, and uh, so this church, uh, pictures were shown, hey, there's no flooding. How come they couldn't open their doors? And they, had, they were pillarized in social media. I mean, pounded on, pulverized. It was the social media disaster for, for Lakewood Church and for the pastor as well. And in fact, uh, there was this one Christian satirist that had a blast with this imagery of this church and this pastor. And he, and he writes, and this is meant to be funny in a very tragic time. This is meant to be funny because sometimes you've got to laugh when things are really bad. But he wrote this. He said, when the floodwaters rise, no one wants to see Joel Olstein float by on his yacht. Okay? And he actually had a picture, if you'd show it, Andy, of... Uh, of a scene of a yacht with this backdrop of Houston in the background, and, and he goes on to have a caption that goes with it, Joel Osteen sails the luxury yacht through flooded Houston to pass out copies of Your Best Life Now. And he goes on to write, and he says, uh, from the deck of his yacht, Joel was offering encouragement with a bullhorn to people that were stranded, and he said, God wants his best for you. Enlarge your vision, develop a healthy self-image, and choose to be happy, Right? Ooh, not a great time for Lakewood Church. But, you know, people are going to love Joel Osteen anyway. They're still going to come to his church anyway. This is a mess, but it's not something they can't work through and get around. But it ought to make you stop and think about it because what Lakewood Church sells in terms of faith is quite contrary to what Jesus tells us to have for faith. Quite contrary to the faith that was required for Colette Salser to deal with the crisis in her life. The two do not line up. They don't match up. And our scripture today from the 11th chapter of Hebrews helps us understand what is the kind of faith that Jesus wants to have. We're able to, to really get a pretty clear picture of what that looks like. We're, re we're able to understand it. And in this verse that begins on the very, in chapter 11, the very first verse, it says, Now faith... Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, that's like a big picture view of what faith is. And for us to really apply what this message gives us, what the book of Hebrews is talking about, we're going to have to, of course, dig a little deeper and uncover what I would like to think is a working definition, something we can live with, something we can really understand to help us figure out how we're going to put that type of faith or make that part, type of faith that is talked about in Hebrews a part of our thinking. Because what really happens for a lot of people is that we view our faith through the prism of our own choosing, right? We, we kind of create our own version of faith, but, but Jesus is pretty specific, and he wants us to use the faith and have the faith that he's told us about, that the Bible talks about. Very specific. So I want to lay some foundation so we make some better choices about how our faith should be in our lives. And I'm going to start with just... Getting you to think about faith in, in your everyday life. You think about it. You go to, you go to uh, the airport, you get on an airplane, and you've placed a tremendous amount of faith in the pilots and uh, the, the guys that are handling air traffic control, the mechanics that have been working on the planes. I mean, you just laid your life on the line for these folks. Put a lot of faith in that. You go to the hospital. You place faith in your doctor and the nurses and the technicians and the anesthesiologists and the pharmacists and you put a lot of faith in the parking lot attendant to keep your car safe while you're there, right? You've just leaped forward in faith when you go there. And then when you think about how we deal with the problems that we have in our lives, whether it's a messy situation we've gotten into on our own 
or it's, it's a, a mess that's created by a natural disaster. There are a lot of different ways to view how we would approach solving these crises in our lives. You know, starting with what a psychologist would say. And a psychologist would tell you, well, look within. And an opportunist would say, well, look around. And an optimist would say, well, look ahead. And the pessimist would say, well, look out. But what do you think Jesus would tell us to say? Jesus and as Christians, we're told to look up. Look up. Look up. Look up. Hold on to. Engage with all your heart and your mind and your strength into a relationship with Jesus. That's the kind of faith that we're trying to build up. And to do that, we need to start by looking at his teachings and the examples that he has given us. Now, what's kind of neat about the book of Hebrews, I found it interesting anyway, is that in this 11th chapter about on the 8th verse, or actually the second verse, it says, by the way, you want some examples of what faith really looks like? Go to the Old Testament, it tells us in Hebrews. Take a look at some characters like Noah, for example. How many of you, raise your hand if God came to you this afternoon and said, listen, I got, I got a little something for you to do. I want you to build me this huge ark and then collect all the animals and take it on this super long journey during this flood, etc., etc. And how many of you would just jump in and say, where do I get started? You know, let me get my car and go over to Home Depot and just get some lumber and get going on this project. Not, but we don't think that way. But that's the kind of faith that the Bible tells us about, the example we're given. And then another example starts with verse 8 is with Abraham. Abraham is told, uh, Abraham, I need you to pack your things, get everything squared away because I'm going to send you into land you have no idea where you're going and no idea what's going to be fa- what you're faced with there. And Abraham says, Okay, I'm, 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 I'm good. And then when he gets there, uh, many years later, he has another uh, problem. He is, of course, without, uh, he and his wife Sarah without child, and he's like older than dirt, and she's not far behind. And God says, because of your faith, I'm going to bless you with a child. Okay. And then we get to the most important view of uh, Abraham's faith, where he is asked to take this son that he's been blessed with and sacrifice him on an altar. And I don't think, I don't think Abraham was so gun home with this particular uh, request of God, but he was obedient. And that's the lesson that we're supposed to take from that is he was obedient because of his faith. Now you look at the other examples that are found in this 11th chapter, and it's like the hall of fame of people that were, that had faith as examples. Rahab and, uh, and a bunch of other ones that were in there. And there's something that you might draw a conclusion of, of looking at all these examples. And you, you might say, hey, these people just jumped in with both feet like they, were, like they had blind faith. But then this is where it gets interesting. This is the interesting part. In chapter ni- verse 19 of this, of this book, Abraham says, uh, no, that's actually not the way I operate. He says, in fact, I examined everything that was happening in my life as I went along. And I, I looked at God's promises, and then I, I thought about it. I reasoned. It actually says the word reasoned in there, and I intellectualized what I had seen and what I have experienced and what I know, and then I had faith. And that's the same thing God wants you to do that Jesus is requiring us to do. The faith that he wants you to have, he doesn't want it to come blindly. He doesn't want somebody just telling you this is what your faith should be like. He wants you to have faith that's based on scriptures, that is absolutely based on your experiences, but it's also based on having a relationship with Jesus. That is the kind of faith that God wants you to have. And he wants you to think about it and make some decisions about it and then embrace it. But for a lot of people, for a lot of folks, well, you know, before you even go there, I think, I think you better build on that foundation what God wants you to do. And, and you need to look at, you know, what are some of the characteristics of all those Hall of Famers, so to speak. You know, and one of, those, one of the characteristics of all those people that were listed, Noah, Abraham, Rahab, all of them, they were humble people. I mean, that, that's something you've got to understand. To really experience the faith Jesus wants, it starts with humility. In fact, in Ephesians 4, Jesus says, complete humility. And then Paul writes another element, another construct of our faith that we need to acquire, which is the servant attitude that he talks about in Philippians 2, 
where Jesus is the example of, of making nothing of himself, and I talked about that a, several times, make nothing of yourself, become a servant, and, and plan your life around serving other people. And he's pretty clear, of course, that we're supposed to love our enemies. That's another construct of our faith. And certainly, whatever is happening today, whatever, good or bad, disaster or, or glorious day, that we're supposed to rejoice in it. I mean, that's the kind of foundation we're building up of our faith. So the, the, just to recap, quick, the foundation of our faith has to be built on examples, on intellect, relationship with Jesus, and then, and, and then there's another step you've got to take, which is, is you have to let go. You have to look up. Now you've got to let go of your doubts and your fears about this. You know, uh, it's a story about uh, this guy that was cleaning his roof. And it's on a three-story house, way up in the air. And he's got, you know, leaves and branches and the usual clutter that's up on the top of somebody's roof. And he's up there working, and all of a sudden, he slips on some leaves. And he begins to plunge off the side, and there's nothing there to stop him. And he goes over the edge of the roof, three stories up, and at the last second, he reaches out and he grabs a hold of it with one hand, the gutter. He's holding, he's just hanging there precariously. And he's shouting for help, and nobody comes. So finally, he turns to the heavens, and he says, My God, my God, help me, help me. And time stops, and the clouds part, and he hears this voice for happen that says, Have faith, let go. He looks down at him, and his arm's getting really tired, and he looks down again, and he looks back to the heaven and says, Well, is anybody else up there? <laughs> it's an element of trust. It's kind of like when Abraham... Mentioned to Sarah, hey honey, we're packing. Get everything collected up. We're just going. And Sarah would have asked, well, where are we going, honey? I have no idea. Just trust me, he said. I mean, it's that kind of trust that we need to have when we make a choice to accept the faith and grow into the faith that Jesus wants us to have. And here's the thing. It's a moving target. Our faith is not static. Because, you know, someday, isn't it true you have a tremendous amount of faith in God? And others, you go, ah. You've got to trust the process, though. Trust with your intellect, with the examples. Trust with your heart, mind, and your soul that what God wants for you is the absolute best for you. And then when you get to that point, where you think you're ready to really acquire the faith that Jesus wants you to have. He, Jesus said, just take a step forward in faith. Act on it. Now, some people, it's a step. Others, though, it's a leap to take that, to, to span that gap between where you are and, and the kind of faith God wants you to have. It's a leap. Big one. I, I was reading uh, about impalas. I think I pronounced that right today. Impalas, right? And uh, in Africa, these impalas are fabulously, tremendously athletic. They, are, they can leap tall buildings with a single bound. That's where they got the Superman thing from, right? Actually, actually a 10-foot structure, they can jump over the top of it. Tremendous. And they can jump out about 30 feet. And they're great athletes, these imp impalas. But there's something weird about impalas. If you can find them, all you need to keep them from running away is a fence only 3 feet high. And the reason is, is because impalas refuse to jump if they can't see where they can land. They epitomize the phrase, looking before you leap. They won't do it. They have this very conservative idea of, of self-preservation. And it, I guess it's worked for them all these years, but they will not jump over that fence because they can't see where they're going to land. Hebrews, on the other hand, completely gives us a different picture, a, a, a picture to look at. It says, you need to leap. And you're not going to know where you're going to land. But that's the kind of faith you need to have. Leap and see what happens. Faith is jumping without actually being able to see where your feet are going to end up. That's what real faith is, the one that Jesus wants you to have. There's this old story about this little guy who was on the second floor now of a burning building. And he yells out to his dad, help me, save me. And daddy says to him, son, you just jump. And the little guy says, but dad, 
I can't see you. And his father says, yes, but I can. Jump. Take a leap. Go for it. Because God is there watching out for you. And I woke up this morning to really unsettling news that the North Koreans have developed a hydrogen bomb. That's no small thing, gang. Very unsettling, actually. And then, in conjunction with that, we know that somewhere out in the Atlantic right now is Hurricane Irma. And it's heading in our way. I don't know if it's going to hit us. or It's going to hit someplace, though, probably. I mean, uh, I mean, we live in a world that is that's complex. It's dangerous sometimes. Uh, we get bruised and beaten and, and bumped and traumatized. It's not an easy place to be. And what Jesus wants us to have is the tools to deal with that real world in which we live. And it's messy. But he says, you have my kind of faith. If you, if you learn to have faith like, like that woman that put her baby on her back, if you have that kind of faith, it'll give you the courage to face the trials that you have to deal with in your life. It'll give you the strength to deal with it. No matter what it gets thrown at you. And you know, with that kind of faith, which is what we talk about at this church, you see, when, if that hurricane came here, do you think we would hesitate to open our doors? Of course not. We'd be the first to open our doors because that's the kind of faith we have in Jesus. That our, we, we just want to act on it. We want to live it out. It's got to be who we are, part of our DNA. And it's also the kind of faith that you know, maybe we can't solve all the problems. Maybe we can't save everybody. But it's the kind of faith that, that makes us be certain and absolute that in the end, there's a place for us in eternity. There's a, there's a room waiting for us to find peace. A place where we could be healed and made new again and it's going to be okay. That's the faith that we talk about here. And that's the kind of faith Jesus wanted his disciples to know as well. And the night before he was crucified, he gave them the foundation for that faith that they might never forget it. And he told it to them in a way that it would be emblazoned on their hearts and that for generation after generation that this story continues so we, we know what Jesus was talking about. And it started at a Passover meal where all the disciples were gathered and at this meal, he held up an ordinary, halfway through the meal, he holds up this ordinary loaf of bread and he, he gives thanks to God and then he, he breaks it in half and, he's, and, he, and he says, my friends, my brothers, this is my body broken for you, a symbol of what it is that I am going to do for you that you might have faith in me. And when the meal was concluded, he held up a, ordinary cup of wine that was symbolic then as he told them after giving thanks to God this is symbolic of my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins which only he could do and that you would know of his love for us because of these are the elements that we can build faith on these are the things that we can trust in so what I want you to do is to plug into that faith right now because I said before our faith is all about our relationship with Jesus. And when you know Jesus, your faith will grow. It's that simple. So come forward and know Jesus this morning. That you might feel the power that is contained in our faith with him. Come forward now and help me share the meal. Thank you. body Christ broken.
the time you give them. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, great are you Lord. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, and all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing, great 